You have uh, equivalent information that's contained in 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. You would have the book of Esther, Esther, Nehemiah, Ezra. You'd have a Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and then you'd have from Isaiah all the way till Malachi. You'd have all that information. That, right? That's a thousand years, a little over a thousand years, jammed between verse 6 and verse 7. And what we have in the Bible is we have uh, what we have for information on this time period is essentially book of uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 through chapter 48 and then some various chapters and verses from the prophets. That's what we have. And so the idea that I was thinking that we could get to verse 7 and 8 and 9 uh, this evening is uh, preposterous. Uh, there's absolutely no way we'd be able to cover that much uh, material. And so we're going to have to uh, go a little slower and recognize some things that we need to take place, that takes place so that we have a better understanding. Verse number one, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither have received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to help us tonight. I ask you to be an encouragement to us as we open your word that you would teach us and guide us in all truth. Lord, the Bible's just as relevant today as the day it was written we ask you to help us to make application in our own lives that we would better be able to serve you. We ask that you speak to our hearts tonight. We ask it in your son's precious name, Jesus, amen. Last week we had talked about all the great things that were going to happen. And not to re-preach last week's uh, sermon here in Revelation chapter 20, but we talked about the era of peace. And we, we talked about how we were given a picture of that, of that thousand years of peace in the life of the King Solomon, who the Bible says had peace on every side. We talked about how it's going to be an era of righteousness, an era of joy, an era of God's glory that's manifest, an era of judgment, an era of the full knowledge, an era of blessings, an era of universal worship, just an era of freedom. We talked about all those uh, things. And yet, I would submit to you, you have two topics that probably aren't preached on enough. You would have the Second coming, which is hardly ever preached on anymore. And then you'd have the obscure uh, Millennium Kingdom, which almost no one seems to preach on and no one seems to, to write on. They're just not enough, they just don't do it. And, and it's probably because it's hard information. But we see in verse number four, he says, I saw thrones and they that sat on them. And so we should recognize that Christ himself is going to be ruling and reigning. He's going to be prophet. He's going to be priest. He's going to be king. Zechariah chapter 6, number verse, verse number 13 said that he was going to be a priest sitting upon his throne. And so we can see the fact that he's going to be reigning. And guess who's going to be reigning with him? There's three groups of people that are going to be reigning with him. That'd be the 12 apostles who are going to reign over the 12 tribes, according to Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. You have the church age saints, praise the Lord, that's us, who inherit the kingdom, who receive crowns. And we talked about the crowns that the, the believer is going to receive or has the chance to receive. And then there'll be those tribulation saints who were martyred for not taking the mark of the beast. And we'll talk about them when we get down to verse number um, four. Or actually, we're in verse number four. We'll, we'll cover them in just a minute. I was looking at my Bible. I'm like, man, verse number. Four, it's, I was trying to see if that if I made a if I covered up number five because verse number four of my Bible is just massive, and it is. There's a lot of truth that, that we have here. And so when the Lord comes back, He's going to come back with that whole host, His army that comes back that we talked about in chapter 19. And on the earth, there's going to be two groups of people. 
On the earth, there'll be two groups of people. There'll be the, those that are resurrected, which will be the, the believers, that, us as we come back. And there'll be those that are natural. Those that have lived through the tribulation, those that haven't taken the mark of the beast. So you'll have a natural man that's going to be there in, in the process. He's going to be there. And so what, what people don't recognize is, is everybody thinks that the millennial kingdom is going to be this great, grand utopia. There'll be no death. There'll be no sin. Well, that's not true. That's not true. For us as believers who have glorified bodies, who are ruling with Christ, we won't be subject to sin. We won't be subject to disease. But boy, those natural people that are still alive, that are going to uh, procreate, they're going to have children, the Jews that are still there, the remnant are still there. So the millennial reign is a recreation of the antediluvian world. The only difference between the millennial reign and the antediluvian world is the fact the antediluvian world had the fallen angels, the sons of God that cohabitated with, with men, or the daughters of man, and caused problems. And so this particular group uh, of natural people are still going to be alive. And they're going to reproduce. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, God says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put in you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you another heart. And so we'll see that these people are going to have a, a new heart. The Jews are going to have a new heart. God's going to start uh, revealing to them his word. And so they're going to have um, full knowledge. Uh, keep your finger here and turn to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. <laughs> Not fair to you, I put a bookmarker in my Bible earlier today at Isaiah 65. Because I knew I was going to turn there, but you, however, had no idea I was going to turn there. This will all make sense here in, in minutes when we get back to Revelation. Uh, Isaiah 65, verse number 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days for a child shall die a hundred years old but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed and they shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant a vineyard and eat the fruit of them they shall not build and another inhabit they shall not plant and another eat for as the days of a tree are the days of my people and my elect shall long enjoy the works or the work of their hand so here you get a picture of the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign. Now, if it's going to be an antediluvian-like world, right, when he comes back, Zechariah chapter 14, he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives and cleave it in half. You need to go back and read that, and all the land mass is going to come back together, and it's going to be like it was in the, in the Garden of Eden. It's going to be like it was pre-flood. And so if it's going to be pre-flood, then everybody's going to live a lot longer. So he alludes to that here in verse number 20. And people have a problem recognizing the fact that if, if it's going to go back to like it was before the flood, people are going to live a long time. And so in verse 20, there's, there, there's a couple of thoughts that, that people struggle with. Notice at the end of that phrase it says, But a sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. And before that it says, For a child shall die 100 years old. And so there's, there's two thoughts there's one thought that says that the people that are, are, are living on the earth at that time, whether Jew or Gentile, God's going to give them a new heart, and they're going to have 100 years to decide, are am I going to serve God, or am I not going to serve God? He's going to be ruling and reigning on the throne, and so he's going to be there. And so some people don't like that idea, but it, it looks like he's going to be there. And the other interpretation that we can apply from this is the fact that... Uh, even though you live a long life, right, 100 years old, and you don't accept Christ, you're willing to die in your sins, you're still a sinner, you're going to be accursed. So those that live a long life are, are, going, to, are going to suffer, just like people do today. Secondly, people forget that if you commit a capital crime during the millennial reign, judgment is the same as it's always been. Uh, so, uh, give you one other uh, aspect of this. Uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 44. Because everybody has this fanciful idea of what the millennial kingdom's like. You've got to recognize people are going to live for a long time. 
But a lot of the sacrifices are still going to have to be made. You're still going to have to go to the temple uh, once every three years. Uh, I alluded to this a while back. If you're a farmer and you're not willing to sac, you're not willing to give to God, and you're not willing to go to Jerusalem, go to the temple, and see King Jesus, then God's going to put a famine on your property. He's going to put a drought on your property, and so it won't rain on your property. And your neighbor will get all the rain. Your crops will all die, but his will glow, his will flourish. And so people forget that. They have this other idea that, that millennial rain is going to be heaven on earth. And it will be for me and you because we're believers now and we're saved. But this is talking about not the believer. This is talking about those that are still left on the earth. Uh, verse number one. Then he brought me back the way of the gate, an outward sanctuary, which looked toward the east, and it was shut. And the Lord said unto me, This gate shall be shut, and it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it. Because the Lord thy God of Israel hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince. Now the prince, that's David. The prince shall sit in it and eat bread before the Lord, and he shall enter by the way of the porch by the gate, and shall go out by the way. And so that's, that's David. That's a resurrected King David who's now a prince, and his, his job during the millennial reign is to be inside the temple eating bread in that inner sanctuary in front of the Lord. Just give you an idea of what it's going to be like. He's going to have a glorified body. We're not talking about those back in Revelation. So this idea that the two groups, that the resurrected, have a job and have a position, and they're no longer affected by sin because we have glorified bodies, but everybody else that's left on the, on the earth, they're going to have a natural body just because it lives for a thousand years like it did pre-flood, just gives them a, a bigger chance to sin and a greater chance of uh, damnation. So I don't know how, I don't know how people would see Jesus on the throne in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning, and ha not have a desire to serve him. Now, that doesn't mean that accidents aren't going to happen because sin still takes place and sin is still prevalent. But you need that information to see what it's going to be like. There's, there's a twofold application. There's a, uh, how, what it's going to be like for the believer today to be in the millennial reign and what it's going to be like to be the natural man who's still alive. Now, back in Revelation chapter 4, he says, I saw thrones. Now, this shows the truth that we found back in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 6, when he had made us kings. So kings, royalty, have thrones. So guess what? He saw thrones. We're going to have thrones. We're going to get a chance to be a, a king as we rule and reign with him so we can see the fact of the truth of Revelation 1, 6. is still true here, Revelation 20, verse number 4. The thrones also show the promise that Jesus gave his apostles. He said in Matthew 19, 28, you shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Matthew 19, 28. The thrones are also proof of the judgment of the nations. Revelation chapter 2, 26, 27, and chapter 3, verse number 21. Judgment was committed to them. And perhaps, perhaps this passage here, as we'll see, I saw thrones, matches what we find in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 9. Daniel chapter 7, verse number 9 says, I, be, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. And his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And so Daniel seen the thrones cast down. And so if the thrones are cast down, and these thrones that we see here, maybe this is an allusion to those angelic rulers. Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse number 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this world. Colossians 1, 16 says, For by him all things were created that are in the heaven and in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So maybe, just maybe the fact that we see the thrones here in verse number 6, this is the judgment of angels that takes place. Those fallen angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2 and 3, talks about how we're going to judge angels. Maybe those thrones that we see that are cast down, maybe that's the devil's minions. And as we've seen, the devil was taken captive, right? We've seen the, we knew he was taken captive because we've seen in verse number 2 that the angel came down and laid hold of the dragon. 
Maybe his minions, maybe those unclean spirits, maybe those, those, those devils, maybe those lying spirits, maybe they were captured as POWs in the battle. And they went right from being a POW right to their, uh, it wouldn't be their, it wouldn't be their, it'd be their military trial, their military tribunal. And we notice that we're, we're never told that they're cast in alive into the lake of fire. Maybe they're, maybe they're executed for, for crimes. Well, we're not told. But remember, I alluded to it last week. We're not told what happens to his minions. They're just, uh, we, we see them active and they're gone and they're, they're, not, they're not thrown in the bottomless pit with the devil and they're, they're not in the lake of fire. But we see here in verse number four that the thrones. And notice it says, and judgment was given unto them. Maybe that means that they were, they were finally judged for their, their crimes. Maybe. Well, we're not told. It, just, it, seems, it seems to fit. And I noticed that almost no, no commentator talks about it, though a few of them were brave enough to mention that it matches Daniel chapter 7, verse number 9. And so uh, that's, quite, that's quite a possibility. And we have to be careful when we study the Scripture and not say anything more than what the Scripture says. And so the fact that I got Daniel chapter 7, verse number 9, and Colossians 1, 16, guess what I don't have? I don't have enough to emphatically say that's absolute truth, but it looks like it. It looks like it. Because you can't find any other judgment of the angels that sit on thrones. And we know that all the, the angels, we know that all the unclean spirits, all the lying spirits, they all have some dominion. They all have some position of authority that was given to them by, by God. And so we, we see them uh, take place here. Notice he says, it goes on, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. So we see the, the six reasons for them being beheaded. Some people were just beheaded because they, they had the witness of Jesus Christ. They were witnessing. So they were executed. Others were executed because they had the word of God. Others were, were executed, they were beheaded for not worshiping the beast. And we talked about that in Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 14. We also see that they were uh, beheaded for not taking the mark in their forehead or in their hand. And so we see the, the six reasons why. And it's just uh, so, so bizarre that they're now telling us, and I'm not trying to alarm anybody, but they're now telling you that you will not be able to refuse the vaccine that's coming for COVID-19. The Supreme Court has already said that you have no right to refuse the vaccine. If the government deems that it's necessary for the health of everybody, they can force it upon everybody. And so I'm not saying the vaccine is, is the, the mark of the beast. I just find it very interesting. But make a note here that the wicked are not resurrected. The wicked are not resurrected. These are, these are the believers these are those that were martyred. Remember, we'd seen back in chapter 6, these are the ones who were underneath the altar. These are the ones crying how long. They finally are resurrected. They're finally uh, rewarded for their, their suffering. Uh, just pretty interesting. And verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again till a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Notice that the resurrection of the tribulation saints is the is, or tribulation martyrs really is the finality to the to the resurrection we've seen the two witnesses were were, were taken up we've seen now that the those that were martyred were taken up and this begins the the reign of a thousand years and last week we'd spent a lot of time talking about how a thousand years is a thousand years and it's amazing how many times you still have to tell people a thousand years is still a thousand years a thousand years to me and you is inconceivable amount of time it is an inconceivable amount of time. And yet, as I'd already told you, that's from uh, 1 Samuel 16, basically all the way to the end of your Old Testament. A thousand years. So it's hard for us to recognize that, but a thousand years where Jesus is going to rule and reign. And so we should rejoice over the fact that we have part in the first resurrection. See, the first resurrection concerns the saints, which is who we are, the believers. The second resurrection concerns the Lord, as you see in verse 13. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. That's all, that's, all, that's all judgment. We don't need to worry about that because we've already been judged. 
We've already accepted his sacrifice. We're willing to put our faith and trust in him. And he said he would seal us. He said he would never forget us. He said he would redeem us. He said that he would provide for us. Remember, he promised. And so he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we have great comfort that we can take in that uh, first resurrection. And the fact that death cannot harm the born again believer. Death cannot harm us, right? We transfer from this life to the, to the next world. We go from here to be with, be with our Savior, like the brother who's, who is longing to go be with King Jesus. He can't wait to get there. He's, he's done with this world. He's not afraid of death. And so there's some things that we can get from this uh, first resurrection. We know that here in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 4, it's called the first resurrection. Well, actually, in verse 5, it's called the first resurrection. In the book of Luke, it's called the resurrection of the just. Luke 14, 14. In John, it's called the resurrection of life. John 5, 29. In the book of Hebrews eleven thirty five, 35, it's called the better resurrection. Philippians says it's a resurrection from the dead. This resurrection is a blessing. This resurrection gives us power. This resurrection is a, a privilege. And that privilege is, is that we rule and reign with him. And so he gives us different positions than we have now. A place of authority, a place of ruling, uh, occupation for a thousand years. And there are three stages to this resurrection. There's the first fruits. Remember, remember the earthquake when Jesus died on the cross and Matthew says there's an earthquake and many of the graves were open. And he took captivity captive and he took him to, to heaven when he, when he went. That's the first fruits. That's already happened. <laughs> we're waiting for the, the gathering. And the gathering's the, the rapture. And we find that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 51 says... Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And so that's the that's the gathering. That's what we're waiting for. Some of us may well get raptured out and some of us might not. God only knows. And then there's the gleanings and the gleanings are Revelation 6, 11. Uh, Revelation 20, verse number 4, right? The martyrs that died, that's the, that's the final gleaning of, uh, of the resurrection, of those that he's going to uh, take up. And so there's eternal blessings of the free gifts of salvation. It's here that we see the second death has no effect upon the believer, and we are happy the fact that we've been snatched from the jaws of death. Right? Revelation, or Romans 6, 23, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And how many people still think that they can earn their way, earn their way, do enough good works? I mean, we've covered, what is that, uh, 15 chapters fit from, from Revelation chapter 5 to Revelation chapter 19. That's 14 chapters, right? 14 chapters. 14 chapters of calamity like we've never seen, and you, no one is able to earn their way to heaven through any of that. I'm not going to be able to do it. There's not going to be a wage sufficient for you to, to pay. If there was, then why did he have to die? That's what people just don't recognize. Now, the fact that we see this, we should recognize what we have in the life through Jesus Christ. Notice back in John chapter 1, verse number 4, the Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It was manifest that he was going to be the way to go. He was going to be the way to have eternal life. He was going to be the way for the resurrection. We, we learn in John chapter 3, verse number 16, that most famous Bible verse. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's through that giving that we can obtain eternal life. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're reading here in John chapter 20, about, I mean, not John chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, about the thrones, about the fact that we're going to be ruling with them, about the fact that we have part in that first resurrection, the fact that we're going to reign with him for a thousand years. Well, that means we're going to have the position. It's been obtained. 
In John chapter 4, verse number 10, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto her, the woman at the well, if thou knewest the gift of God. You know what people don't know today? People today do not know the gift of God. People do not see the gift of God. They're not looking for the gift of God. And I'm telling you, that redeemed life that we have because we've been born again, boy, gives us that gift of God. Remember that day that someone presented you the gift of God? The people that live during the millennial reign, they're going to see God with their own eyes. They don't have to exercise any faith. They have to make an intellectual decision. I'm either going to trust that or I'm not going to trust that. And they've got 100 years to come to that decision. But we, we can see the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. You know what we have through that gift? We have a possession. We have a possession that can't be taken away. We have a possession that's been gifted to us. Not only is it a possession, but it's able to sustain us. Turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. <laughs> <laughs> of, of the four gospels the book of john is still my default it is still my favorite gospel as much as i love the book of mark and enjoyed preaching through it the book of john still is it's my default i always go back to it it is so powerful probably because it was the first gospel book that i read and it was the first time that i seen jesus for who he was and I seen how that Pilate, knowing the truth, decided not to act because he was a politician. That's why I don't like politicians, because they try to weigh everything out and try to see how they can walk that narrow line. And you know what God is doing through all of this in my lifetime, in the last 20 years? God is removing, all, removing that fence. You're not able to straddle that fence anymore. He keeps removing all these issues. You're either for him or you're against him. But he's removing all of it. But we see here in, in John chapter 6, verse number 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Aren't you glad that he's the, the bread of life? He sustains us. Bread is what you need. I remember early in my marriage, uh, a few times over my in-laws and eating. And I didn't grow up a farmer. I didn't grow up in a, in a farm household. But there were two staples that had to be on the table at every meal. There had to be butter. And there had to be bread. There always had to be bread. Always at the table. And aren't you glad that Jesus is our bread? He says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. You're going to rule and reign with him in a glorified body that doesn't age for a thousand years and you'll never hunger. You'll have to choose to eat. This interesting as, as you get older, so, and I don't have this problem, but, but some elderly people have this problem. They forget to eat. They forget to eat. We have a few that come here. They just forget to eat. I don't know how you could forget to eat, but they forget to eat. And Jesus said, he will never hunger. He sustains us. Aren't you glad that he sustains us? I'm so glad that he sustains us. You're in John, just go to chapter 7. Just go to chapter 7. He ministers to us. So we're, we're going to be there with him. We're going to have a throne. We're going to rule and reign. He ministers to us now. He's going to minister to us then. John chapter 7, verse number 38. Notice it says, He that believeth on me and on the scripture has said, Out of his belly shall flow the living water. He's going to minister to us. We're going to watch him there minister to the people. Aren't you glad that you won't have a position like David? Aren't you glad that you don't know what your position is going to be? You're going to be able to see him. And he's going to minister. Out of his belly is going to flow living waters. 
Revelation, as we'll see later, that, that, that river is going to come out from the throne. You need to go back and read the book of Zechariah and you'll see that that, that water is going to flow from him and it's going to heal the land. That's living water. But yet he's able to minister to us today. He's able to meet our needs. Uh, turn over to John chapter 10 for just a second. John chapter 10. 10, 10. Remember, reminiscent of an old deacon that used to be out street preaching and he would always he would always loudly proclaim this verse John 10:10 10, 10, the thief the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy but I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly not only is he going to minister to us he's going to give us that abundant life he's been giving me this abundant life since he saved me but you want to know what? That life's not going to stop. That abundance is not going to stop. It's going to carry right on into the millennial reign. For a thousand years. An abundant life. Verse number 9, he said, I am the door. And by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall go in and go out. Abundance. We have it. We have access to it. And you're in John, just look over to chapter 11. Verse 24 and 25. Always going to be a favorite passage of mine. First real passage I ever preached in a church service, in a Sunday school. I was given these two verses as the golden text that you have to mention. Verse 24, John 11, verse 24. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet, he, yet shall he also live. We're resurrected. We're, we're resurrected. We, we have that. We have that all in him. All through Christ. All through what he's done for us by willing to come and shed his blood and die for our sins. So thankful for it. Back in Revelation. Notice what he says here. In verse number 6. Revelation 20 verse number 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Remember when we started this study back in chapter 1, I talked about the, the blessings that are found in this book. Boy, there's a blessing to be part of that first resurrection. But notice, it goes on and says, On such a second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God. Again, you've got another fulfillment of the promise that was given to us in Revelation 1, verse number 6. And he hath made us kings and priests. You see that? We've got a throne and we've got a position. Even in the millennial reign, we'll be priests. We'll be part of the royal priesthood. We'll have something better than Aaron ever had. Better than the Aaronic priesthood. What a blessing. Millennial reign comes down to the fact that during this time, God is going to put down rebellion on earth. He's going to give man an opportunity to, to, to live, though he's going to be there. And so that God may be all in all again as before the rebellion. Both the rebellion of Lucifer, Ezekiel chapter 28, and the rebellion of Adam in Genesis chapter number 3. Going to give man one more chance. And he's eliminating. He's going to eliminate the adversary. He's going to eliminate the temptation. And then you wonder, how are people still going to have the, the courage to rebel against God? How are you going to have the courage to re rebel against the, the Savior that rules on the throne? During the time of the millennial reign, boy, he's coming back to fulfill the everlasting covenants. The Abrahamic covenant is going to be fulfilled. Genesis chapter number 12. The covenant with Isaac is going to be fulfilled. According to Genesis chapter 26. The covenant with Jacob, according to Genesis chapter 28, is going to be fulfilled. The Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17, is going to be fulfilled. In eternity, Jesus is king and he's going to rule. And we have part of that. Aren't you excited about that? Millennial reign is going to vindicate and avenge Christ and his saints. 
The fact that we see the, the martyrs there receiving, I suppose, the rewards of their suffering. The fact they're going to be in the temple and, and minister to him. God's going to vindicate. We're going to see the restoration of Israel and the deliverance of them. That's why you need to go back and read Ezekiel 37 and 38 so you can start to understand. Though we've seen all kinds of great things with Israel today and the world we live in, boy, they still have not been restored and they still have not been delivered. Millennial reign is to exalt the saints of all ages to a kingly and priestly position. Isn't that exciting that you'll be royalty? Isn't that exciting that you'll minister right there while he's there, he'll be able to see you, be able to gather in one place all things in earth and in heaven. He's going to judge the nations in righteousness. The earth is going to be restored. He's going to re restore the righteous and eternal government. He's going to fulfill hundreds, hundreds of prophecies concerning the millennial reign. Hundreds of prophecies. This is the part that, that, that blows my mind as I, I read and have all the books and then you want to study the millennial reign and you can't hardly find anything because no one writes on it. No, no one preaches on it. We're going to probably need to. It's an exciting time what, we have, what we're looking forward to. He's going to restore all things as before sin entered the world. During the millennial reign. And guess what's still going to be taking place? People still going to sin, still going to have that farmer looking at the neighbor's farmer going, I don't get it. I don't get it. I go, to, I, go to, I go to temple three times a year like I'm supposed to. I go to temple once every three years. And I, I go ahead begrudgingly give my sacrifice and my, my offering to God. And then look at my crops. I can't get anything to grow. The locusts come. And then look at my neighbor over there. That's Cain and Abel. Just on a grander scale. Cain gave, Abel gave, and Abel left every time happy because God received his offerings. And Cain's offerings just sat on there. You're going to see it. It's a heart condition. It doesn't matter whether God's in heaven or whether God's ruling on the earth. The heart of man is still only evil continually. And though people will live for an extended period of time, just go back and read Genesis chapter Five, though they lived for a long time, and though they could see the Garden of Eden, though they could see the cherubims at the eastern gate, it didn't change their position. And so a sinful man, a sinful woman, even though they can see God, even though they can see his son ruling and reigning on the throne on earth, it's not enough to change their heart. We have to put in our hearts either, I'm going to serve God, or I'm not going to serve God. Either, I, either I, I look at my heart and say, boy, I'm a sinful man, I'm wicked, and I need God working in my life. Other people look around and go, you know, I'm not so bad. That's all right, I can get my, I can maybe, I can maybe route some pipes over to my property and, and, and get by. Maybe they can. But notice, but notice in verse 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out for a season, or loosed of his prison, and he shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters. We blame too many things on, on the adversary. We need to start taking accountability of our own lives and recognize that it's not, it's not the devil, it's not the world. You know who it is? It's that dirty old rotten scoundrel inside me. It's that old dirty, rotten scoundrel inside you that has a propensity for sin because we don't like the light. And they'll see it, we'll see it here. But aren't you glad that we'll be ruling and reigning with us? Aren't you glad that you have a promise that is yet to be fulfilled that is going to be so gracious, so grand, so, so neat that there's hardly enough information in the Bible about it? Then Jesus tell didn't he tell him if I if I tell you earthly things you won't believe how can I tell you heavenly things we can't even get by on this earth right now and minister and get by with what God has given us in His Word how much more so you suppose it'll be when He's right there and we have the mind of Christ 
I'm telling you, it's going to be a glorious time for, for those that have part of the first resurrection. You might say tonight, I don't, I, I don't know anything about the resurrection. I don't, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I believe you. It's right here. Today's the day of salvation. Hope that today would be the day that you'd recognize that, boy, Jesus is the resurrection. And that without Jesus, you won't see the first resurrection. And if you won't see the first resurrection, come back and... Two weeks and you'll learn all about the great white throne judgment let's pray father ask that you'd help us as we continue to go forward and live a life that glorifies you we ask that you'd be an encouragement to us help us to be the ministers that you've called us to be lord we know one day we'll be kings and priests ruling and reigning with you and what a glorious time that'll be as we see the earth come back to her fullness as we see all the wickedness of sin and depravity removed from the creation and lord even during that time men still have a desire to sin lord we ask you to help us to seek after you we're thankful that you've given our part given to us the first resurrection what a blessing it is we ask you to watch over us and keep us safe we ask these things in your son's name jesus amen amen and thanks for coming out this evening we invite you to come back sunday morning sunday school at 9:15. We'll be talking about some of the sins of Martin Luther. If you can't come, I encourage you to tune in 95.7, Thunder Country. Be on the radio at 9 a.m. preaching great swelling words. And we'll see you Sunday morning, 1030. Be preaching, what is your life? It is even a vapor. We'll see you. God bless. See you soon.